This is designing a programming language for local reasoning and easy debugging. As Pavel said, my name is Robin. Uh, by day, I work as an IT consultant at Beck, which is a Norwegian consultancy firm. Uh, and when I'm not doing consulting, I work on this programming language called Grem, or, or Gren, you can say whatever, but it's a Norwegian word. Uh, as a quick summary, uh, Gren is a purely functional, statically typed programming language with ML syntax. Uh, it aims to be small and easy to learn while still being performant and expressive enough for general use. Uh, Gren targets JavaScript for maximum portability, um, and perhaps the most important part is that it's still very early in development. Uh, it's still very much a work in progress. Uh, the most common question I get when I say that I work on a programming language is why. <laughs> why are you doing this? Uh, why should I care? Uh, and these are very intimidating questions to answer, uh, but they're good questions to answer. And it's important to keep those questions in the back of your mind uh, as you work on the language. Because ultimately, there is no such thing as the perfect programming language, uh, but I believe you can get pretty close if you have like a set of constraints and uh, use cases in mind. So in order to talk about the design of Gren, we have to talk about the projects that I work on. So as a consultant, I tend to work with big corporations, both public and private. Uh, usually, they are not technically advanced, like we, we mostly create Rust, ser uh, Rust services that push JSON blobs around. Uh, they're relatively low traffic, and by relatively, I mean they're big on a national, like Norwegian scale, but Norway is a country with 5.5 million people. <laughs> so if you have 700,000 monthly users, you're one of the biggest services we got, right? Uh, and most services are not that big, so relatively low traffic. But even though they're not technically advanced, and even though they're not you know, high traffic services, they're still very important. If one of these things go down, you can make, and I have made, the national news, uh, which is, let me tell you, hilarious. Um, uh, or at the, or you know, in the best case, by going down, you can lose the company several tens or hundred thousands of dollars in revenue, right? So, so, uh, so they're important. Uh, the second thing to note is that I'm a consultant. Uh, I don't tend to stick around on projects for very long, relatively speaking. And what that means is that I tend to work in code bases that I have relatively little experience with. Uh, so based on that, my ideal programming language makes it easy to understand what code does, and perhaps more importantly, doesn't do, without requiring that I know the entire code base. Uh, my ideal programming languages has a set of guarantees and has excellent tooling, which makes it easy to pinpoint and fix problems. Uh, and as like just a side note, uh, performance is one of the things I worry least about. Uh, so it shouldn't be a blocker, but it also shouldn't influence the design of the language at all. Another way of saying all these things uh, is that my ideal programming language should enable local reasoning and easy debugging. But what does that mean? So for local reasoning, what I mean by that is that I should be able to look at a function implementation and without knowing what sort of global states around that function, without knowing the implementation details of the function that function again calls, uh, I should be able to reason about what it does uh, or doesn't do. Uh, one example of this is immutability. So if you have a language that enforces immutable data, it becomes very easy or yeah, it becomes easier to reason about the data flow of your program without having to know every single detail. You don't need to know how a function is implemented uh, very low in the call stack to be able to answer the question, does this thing change, right? Now, there are tons of languages that deal with immutable data. Uh, one thing that I think uh, a lot of languages don't do to the same degree has to do with error handling. So let's pretend for a moment that this is Haskell. It's not. It's Elm. Uh, but I realized after submitting the slides that what I'm about to say makes no sense if it was Elm. So let's pretend it's Haskell instead. Uh, so you can imagine that this is a, a function that's called as part of a web request. Uh, and essentially what we're trying to do is to check if the user who makes the request is allowed to look at some resource, in this case an account. 
So Haskell is statically typed. So if this compiles, you know that the types make sense, that the data we're accessing makes sense. Uh, and if you compile with exhaustiveness checking, you can be reasonably cer certain that all uh, conditions or all return values of decode user details are in fact handled. Uh, but one thing you can't be entirely certain of is if this is going to throw an exception. And again, I, I worked on services where you know going down, having downtown can make the national news, and when that happened, it was one of these things, right? It was a bug in something that was called on every single request. It threw an exception that we weren't aware of, and it brought the service down. But in uh, certain languages like Elm and Gren, uh, if this compiles, then you have handled every single error, because in those languages, you're not allowed to define exceptions. You're not allowed to throw exceptions. Uh, that's not to say that exceptions can't occur, like you can run out of memory and uh, blow the stack, but uh, the only way to represent errors is through a union type, and union types are checked for exhaustiveness. So if this compiles, then you have handled any potential errors. Another thing to talk about is managing side effects. So this, again, is Haskell. Um, and the interesting thing to note, like this is some fictional load from cache function that takes a key, and maybe returns a cached value. And the interesting thing to note is this I.O. thing, uh, which means that the value can come from local disk, from the network, or even a combination of the two. Uh, and this is very helpful. Like, if I'm looking for a specific strange I.O. thing happening, I can do a very easy search through the code base and figure out these are the potential places where that can happen, and I can focus on that. Uh, and I can disregard anything that doesn't perform I.O. Uh, what I wish, um, what I would love to have like seen be better in this is that this is very coarse grained, like this is binary. Either it performs, either it can perform I/O or it can't. Uh, now currently, my client is a bank, and like when we pull in dependencies, we have to answer the question: Is this dependency safe to use, or is this going to like log anything we pass to it so, to some remote server? or something. Like, we have to be able to answer that question with a reasonable degree of certainty. And so ideally, I would like this to be more precise, more fine-grained. So one thing we're exploring in GRAN is to have like a, a fine-grained permission system. So this is an excerpt, or this is some t signature from the file system module. And we have a function that allows you to open a file for read access. But in order to call this function, you need a permission. And GRAN is funny in that, uh, Packages and applications are two entirely different set of projects, and there are different rules surrounding them. And the only type of project that is allowed to retrieve a file system permission is applications. So if you're writing a package, there is actually no way for you to obtain a file system permission that has to be passed to you from the application. So as an application author, you have full control over where and which side effects can occur. So from a t design perspective, let's talk a bit about trade-offs, because you know, the things I just talked about does have trade-offs. If everything is going to be immutable, if every side effects need to be handled, especially in like a, f a fine-grained way, uh, and if every single error has to be handled, there is no escaping that you're going to write more code than you would in other types of languages that don't do these things. But for the sort of stuff that I work on, that is a very easy trade-off to make. Let's talk about debugging especially step-by-step uh, -step debuggers. Now, I, I'm going to assume that most people in the room has used a step-by-step -step debugger <laughs> and know what that is, right? But it, I, I, it's still worth noting, because I think it's a tremendously useful tool, uh, and its value is undersold. Uh, but just you know, to, to quickly list a few use cases, you can use a step-by-step -step debugger in an application you don't know, and I, I tend to work in such applications. Just set a breakpoint at a place, with maybe in the main function, and just step down everywhere and explore how execution happens. Uh, for new people, people who haven't touched pure functional programming languages before, I came to know that having a step-by-step -step debugger, debugger would significantly help them understand how values change or don't change and how that propagates to the system. And of course, sometimes uh, reasoning, just even though I understand code and I believe it's correct and the compiler tells me that everything matches up, being able to just see what are the values right now would be a tremendous help. So here is, a, here is some code from the Grand Compiler, which is written in Haskell. 
And that's why I, th that's why all the examples are Haskell, because the one language I know, right? Uh, uh, and this code has to do with encoding source maps. And I was reasonably certain that this was correct, but there was one case that failed, and I couldn't figure out why. So I thought I was going to set a breakpoint here. Uh, and my goal was to kind of like figure out what are the intermediate values here. But since Haskell is lazily evaluated, I'm not actually told what those values are at this point. So I thought, okay, I'm going to step through to the next line of execution to realize some values, which means I step up here, like backwards in time. Uh, but I still don't really learn anything, because in order to compute new num, you need to compute num, uh, which means we're going to step outside the function. And we're going to, like, new num is in some constant, right? So we have to calculate what num is. And so we're going to step through this a couple of times, and then we're going to end up here. Now, this is because Haskell is lazily evaluated. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are, there are a lot of cool use cases for lazy evaluation. But in the case of a debugger, I would say, that it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to quickly find the information you're looking for. Um, this is my most common exception or crash that occurs when developing the Gideon compiler. Uh, and here we, we can see that there is a map lookup uh, that has failed, and that's all I get to know. Uh, now in the compiler, we do a lot of lookups. So it has narrowed down the field a little bit, but not like I still don't know where this where this happens, and so I still have to spend significant energy in finding a place. Now, I'm not like I've been I've been writing on and off in Haskell for about a year and a half, so I'm not I'm not good at it. Uh, so there might be some compiler flag I could send in and that will fix my problem. But I'll do that. Thank you. <laughs> now let's switch uh, let's switch a little bit. This is uh, Elm. Or more specifically, this is the JavaScript that the Elm compiler outputs. Because if you want to do like step-by-step -step debugging on Elm, this is what you're forced to do. Um, there are two problems. First, this isn't the code that I wrote. Uh, and the second problem is that you know here's uh, the small range value. And as you can see, that is this obvious thing. Uh, this is supposed to be a linked list. Now, if you do this enough, and having written parts of the data structures in Elm's core library, I've done this a ton. And so you eventually gain an intuition for what, how Elm code maps over to JavaScript code. Uh, but I think most of you, like if I were to show this to beginners, Elm beginners, they would throw their hands up and run away. <laughs> so in comparison, uh, this is Gren. Uh, so Gren outputs source maps, which is a way of teaching the browser or the Node.js runtime how JavaScript maps over to source code. So in Gren, you can, in fact, set breakpoints in the source code that you wrote. You can see we're passed in the breakpoint here, and you can see what the values are. Uh, Gren also uses uh, primitive JavaScript types. So uh, the default list structure in Gren is just a JavaScript array, and that makes it very easier to inspect state and debugger. So from a design perspective, Having a good debugging experience does mean a, uh, certain trade-offs. Right? Strict evaluation helps. Uh, readable stack traces by default helps. Uh, being able to debug the actual source code, well, that's table stakes. But to generate the debug information required for that does complicate the compiler some. And of course, using the target platform's primitive types makes it easier to inspect state. Another uh, interesting thing to note, especially when it comes to JavaScript, is that if you want uh, a step-by-step -step debugging that's close to what you would expect from debugging JavaScript, you also can't take too many liberties in optimization. You can't inline too much stuff, because then there's nowhere for the JavaScript to stop and map back to the code you wrote. Now, do we need a new language for this? Now, there are other things I care about, but these two are like these two are the most important things in my day-to-day -day job. Do we need a language for this? In isolation, probably no. Right? There, you could probably write some fine-grained system for Haskell, and someone probably has. Right? Uh, and you can probably use some flags and stuff to get a better debugging experience. But this question does raise uh, an interesting thought, and that is that the problem with a new programming language is that they have to be learned. Someone has to spend a significant amount of time and commitment uh, to learn the language. And people usually have a very limited amount of those things. Uh, and to make matters worse, few people are willing to learn a new technology uh, 
if they are not entirely certain about its future. Uh, now some people, and probably some people uh, other than me in the room, are language nerds. We just love learning new things all the time. Uh, but other people have three kids, a dog, and a garden to attend, right? And so they don't have the time uh, for those sorts of things. So I would say that like, if you're going to make a new programming language, one important thing to make sure of is that that language is small, uh, that it has relatively few but powerful concepts that compose. Um, and also it helps if it's portable. Like if, you, if you're going to take the time and investment to learn this, that skill set can be applied in many areas, not just one. So if we're going to uh, evaluate ourselves against other languages, the problem with Haskell, really, the, in my mind, is that it's too big. It's too complicated. Many people, uh, present company excluded, just don't have the time. It's too big of an undertaking to do that as part of your, of, of your work. Uh, uh, Elm, on the other hand, is very, very good at this. Like, it's a very small language. It has only the things that give you the most value. Uh, but Elm really is geared for single-page applications in the browser, and that's where it shines, that's where it's good, and everything else you kind of have to do a little bit of extra work uh, in order to get there. Uh, and of course, as you saw, the debugging experience could be miles better. So again, Gren is a small, simple, uh, so it's a small language with simple but powerful features that compose. It aims to be learnable with a very low time investment, as low as we can get. Uh, it's it's good, great, I think, for local reasoning. It integrates well with the JavaScript debugger, and because it compiles to JavaScript, you can use it almost everywhere. There should be an asterisk there. Like, it's still early in development. Everything's not great, but that's the goal. And that's all I had. Thank you, Robin, for the talk. Now we've got a few minutes for any questions. Thank you. Um, what was the main reason for choosing JavaScript as a target language as opposed to, for instance, uh, WebAssembly? Uh, right. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that um, Gren started as a fork of Elm and Elm targets JavaScript. Uh, and so that's just what we, we got at this point in time, and uh, my main priority is kind of like fix, is, is creating the rest of the language, and then maybe down the line I'll look at WebAssembly. Uh, and the problem right now is that the Gren, um, JavaScript, Elm, Gren compiler uh, hasn't been made, like uh, types, for instance, isn't carried over to the code generation stage. So in order to target WebAssembly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the compiler. Uh, and right now, I'd rather focus that energy on um, finishing the language itself. So I, I yeah, uh, I wrote a language before Elm because that's what I do, uh, and uh, that target WebAssembly. So I, like you can work around most of the current limitations in WebAssembly, so it'll work, but it's just it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for a great talk. So you compare Haskell, Elm, and of course Gren. Um, Elm has a kind of a very similar language, maybe competition even, called PureScript. I'm wondering if you have considered it, if you have used it, and if yes, uh, why didn't it, uh, well, was sufficient? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I did uh, mention PureScript in like the early versions of this talk, but I essentially, PureScript, while strictly evaluated, and it might even have source maps, uh, it, it has a lot of the same, it has uh, some of the same complexity as Haskell. And so I'm, I guess the thing is that I, I, I've managed to convince managers to use Elm in production. I am very uncertain that I would be successful with PureScript or Haskell. I just don't think, like it's so complex that I don't think uh, that would be an easy sell. Good question though. No, a last question. Uh, wouldn't it be easier to just add a uh, source map generation to Elm than just develop your own language? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But like, so, so, so I, I used to be part of the core team. I have worked on the standard library. I worked on the, the Elm's time-traveling debugger. Uh, 
uh, and done a couple, a couple of other contributions. If I thought there was a chance that I could nudge Elm in this direction, Gren would not exist. So thanks again. <clears throat> Please uh, give a final round of applause for Robin. Thank you.